Hello, and welcome to another edition of Sri's Sunday New York Times Read Along. Our guest this week is Walter D. Grayson, professor of history at McAllister College. My name is Neil Parikh, and I'll be the guest host for today's show. We're live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and our Digimenters website. Please like, please comment, please share. Let us know where you're watching from. We're looking forward to a great show today. We're going to be covering a lot of the conversation is going to focus on Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. It's been the focus of Walter's research for several years. We'll also talk about the changes in uh, Twitter and the midterm elections. We'll also cover a special section in today's paper, uh, Thanksgiving Pies. You may, if you joined us two weeks ago, Wayne Camadoy gave us a very special sneak preview. That special section is in print today. So go ahead and uh, let us know where you're watching from. We're going to show you a quick promo video uh, of what to expect in today's show. And uh, note that this is a, a little bit of a different version of our promo video, uh, but still uh, covers all of our bases. Thank you. Our guest on this week's edition of Sree's Sunday New York Times Read Along is Walter D. Grayson, professor of history at McAllister College. We have a great show planned for you today. We'll be focusing on Black Panther, the subject of Walter's research for the last several years. He's developed what's called the Wakanda syllabus. We'll ask him about it. We'll also take a look at the New York Times coverage of Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Here's the review by A.O. Scott, focusing on women on the home front. There's also a great article about Namor, the uh, villain in this week, this uh, uh, movie. There is also a great article on the soundtrack of Wakanda Forever. Uh, Wakanda Forever forges international alliances on a somber soundtrack. We'll also take talk about the changes at Twitter. Walter had a viral tweet uh, that showed the changes at Twitter as an example of counter-convergence. We'll ask him about that. We'll also uh, talk about Sri's Sunday Note. The Elon Musk era begins at Twitter. For now, Sri is staying on Twitter, as am I. And we'll also talk about the midterm elections. Overnight, the news Democrats retain power in the Senate with the win in Nevada. There is certainly a lot to cover. Again, we want to thank our production team. In addition to Sri and myself, Paula Kiger is producing the show on Facebook and LinkedIn. We want to thank our longtime sponsor, Muckrack, and mention that Sri Sunday New York Times Read Along is produced by Digimenters. We're live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and our Digimenters website. Please like, please comment, please share. Please tell your friends about today's show. That gives you a glimpse as to what's to come in today's show. And again, we are live on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and our Digimenters website. Let's go around and uh, welcome some of the folks watching today. Uh, we have Patricia Freudenberg watching, uh, saying greetings to the New York Times read-along team and guest watching from New York. Thank you, Patricia. Miriam Berkeley is watching from Hell's Kitchen in New York City. Thank you, Miriam, as always. Uh, we have a user watching from Berlin. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know who is watching from Berlin. It didn't come. Sandeep CK, I just checked LinkedIn for you. I'm not sure why uh, your picture and name didn't show up, but Sandeep, thank you for watching. Smita Narayan is watching from London, also on LinkedIn. So it really shows our international audience. Uh, and uh, with the time change, it's a little bit different. It's a uh, 1.30 show in uh, GMT, not British summertime. 
So thank you for making that adjustment. Nikhil is watching from Greenwich, Connecticut. Nikhil, thank you. Ted Colbin watching on YouTube from Washington, D.C. Thank you so much, Ted. Linda Lawrence joining us from a chilly and rainy Long Island. Yes, the temperature did drop. It was like 70 degrees here in D.C. yesterday. And last night, I actually went out to watch Black Panther doing some last-minute prep for the show. And it was cold and windy when we walked out of the theater uh, just after midnight. Uh, temperatures definitely dropped. Deborah Kerr is heading south from Asheville ahead of the snow. I didn't realize there was going to be snow in uh, in Asheville, Deborah. Watching from uh, Beaufort, South Carolina. And Deborah liked the promo. Thank you, Deborah. Appreciate it. Uh, again, it's a it, the production value was a little bit different than what we usually do, but uh, we uh, sometimes have to uh, uh, make do and, and throw things together at the last minute. That's just the reality of production. Ken Fisher is watching Good Morning from 20 Minutes North of the Iowa Writers Workshop. Thank you, Ken. Um, and there we see Patricia tagging friends on LinkedIn to encourage them to watch. Thank you, Patricia. That's always helpful. Um, and uh, we have uh, someone watching... Ujang uh, is watching. I'm sorry. I'm, I don't want to make the uh, mistake of, of uh, butchering your name. Uh, I hope I pronounced that uh, um, correctly. But thank you for watching on Facebook. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a great show planned for today. Uh, we'll be uh, covering Black Panther, Twitter, the midterm elections, of course, the New York Times, and a special section on Thanksgiving pies. Uh, we have Ellen Austin watching from the Upper East Side. A tad late. Ellen, you're right on time. We are just doing our uh, our welcomes uh, to all the folks who are watching. And I can't jump to the paper before welcoming my mom. Hi, mom. How are you doing? Watching from India. She's in India for a few months. Uh, we're so so happy to to uh, have you watch, Mom, and uh, thank you for being such a loyal supporter. So with that, uh, what we want to do is to take a look at the front pages of the New York Times uh, before we uh, uh, move on to the focus of today's show. So with the uh, New York Times today, we have our front page. And uh, as you can see, the banner headline, Democrats hold a Senate with Nevada win. Uh, the the lead story, uh, which is also important, control of the House remains unclear. Uh, that's something that we we are still waiting and watching. But the big news is that um, it was much closer than anyone expected. So we will uh, we'll we'll look for results to come, to come in, in there, there. Uh, uh, as uh, uh, as, uh, as we, we continue looking, looking at, at the. the um, at the, at front, the front page, page the, the display, display photo, photo is actually from, from Ukraine. Ukraine. Humanitarian, Humanitarian concerns. concerns. Person in Ukraine on Saturday, on Saturday despite, despite the city's joy, there, there was no heat, water, water or electricity. Or electricity. Uh, uh, Ukraine slow, signals, signals, signals no slowdown, slowdown during, during winter. winter. Um, um, the, the other, other the big story on the front page above the fold, UK legal tactic unevenly hits black people despite ruling group prosecutions persist. Below, Below the fold, you see this um, uh, preview, preview of, of the pie section. section. Uh, pumpkin, pumpkin, you've got company. company. Nine, Nine Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving ready pies with, with classic, classic dinner, dinner spirit. spirit. Updated, updated with flavors we crave now. now. From, from left. left. Sorry about the echo on that. The uh, From left, uh, pecan sandy, blackberry apple, and cranberry lemon meringue. A special section. Internal papers show how close FBI came to using spyware and the wipeout that wasn't. This is what my point earlier, how midterms got so tight. I'll admit that going into the midterms, I was concerned about the uh, results. I assumed, like others, that we were going to have a Republican uh, wave, and that didn't happen. And it's we're, it's very close. The Democrats might hold on to the House, maybe uh, lose majority by one seat which was uh, definitely interesting. The ad at the bottom of the page is also worth noting, the show of a lifetime, The Lion King. You see these big ads in the Times <clears throat> now. 
no wraparound ad this week. But here is that New York Times cooking special on pies. We had a preview of this last um, two weeks ago when Wayne Camadoy was our guest. Your pies have arrived. Apple, pecan, pumpkin, lemon meringue. They're all here as you've never seen them before. We'll be asking you about your fa favorite pies for Thanksgiving or pies in general when we take a look at this special from New York Times Cooking. Sunday opinion. Will the GOP learn that going fringe isn't a winning strategy? Voters can tell what parties actually care about. By Ezra Klein, election deniers are down but not out. And the graphic, which you can't really see when you look at just the front half and the bottom half, is effectively, I'm going to fold this a little bit differently so you can see this, it's effectively a MAGA hat covered in tinfoil um, to highlight, um, you know, uh, make a great, make America great again hat covered in tinfoil. Um, so that's uh, worth noting. The uh, Sunday business is the bike thieves of Burlington. The hunt for stolen goods has put citizens and business owners in the center of a debate about policing and a growing, sometimes violent, problem with crime. Sunday Styles, again, the, the content is below the fold. Uh, this time, she's the story. As the self-effacing Judy Woodruff leaves the, the anchor desk, her colleagues describe how she rose to the top. This story is by Catherine Roseman, a former guest on the New York Times Read Along. About three years ago, if I'm not mistaken, I remember Sri went to her house. Um, as either it might have even been 2018, if uh, um, if I'm not mistaken, back when we were only on Facebook Live. So that's certainly worth uh, taking a look at. Um, we have uh, Arts and Leisure. Steven Spielberg makes it personal. His life behind the camera leads him to one story he hasn't told. It wasn't easy. Uh, this is by A.O. Scott. Um, and we certainly saw an interview with, uh, I saw an interview with Seth Rogen, who plays Spielberg's father in the movie. It definitely looks looks interesting. T Magazine. I don't usually spend a lot of time on T Magazine. This is the uh, New York Times style magazine tr focusing on travel. The worlds that were searching for echoes of lost cultures in Spain, Singapore, and Tajikistan. Uh, definitely uh, worth taking a look at. And you can, I mean, you can't tell on on the show, you know, when you're watching it uh, on the video. But this is a heavy, heavy section, thick, if you can tell from the uh, number of pages. The book review, building blocks in the Song of the Cell. Uh, Siddhartha, Siddhartha Mukherjee finds medical mystery and metaphor at the cellular level um, is the cover story. And the New York Times Magazine. Now, you're not looking at this wrong. This is a jumbled mess. Uh, I don't remember seeing the New York Times doing their front page of their magazine this way before. We live in an age of destruction, the tech and design issue. And you can see how... Uh, the, mass, the, the New York Times magazine kind of curves around here. They have the date in the corner. Definitely an interesting approach. So we'll definitely want to uh, take a look at that later. Um, but here we go. This is the Sunday New York Times for you back in place. And we'll go ahead and get on uh, with some of the, the comments that we have uh, that uh, have folks have uh, joined. So let's see um, what is going on. We have, um, let's see here, and um, let's get back into the comments. Yes, uh, I see the comments about the echo. Uh, sorry again. Paula Kiger is saying good morning from Tallahassee, Florida, much chillier today than it was yesterday. Uh, Paula is uh, part of our production team, and uh, we want to thank you again for joining us. Of course, you see Sri and myself on camera, uh, but you, uh, you know, Sri is the host and I'm the uh, guest host, uh, executive producer and guest host. Um, but uh, um, Paula is producing show the show from on Facebook and LinkedIn. And so we always thank her for her work on the show. We also want to acknowledge 
our sponsor, Muckrack, uh, and remind you that this show is produced by Digimentors, uh, the social and uh, digital uh, consulting company that Sri started with his friend, uh, Andrew Lee, several years ago. I'm proud to be a vice president of events and communications for Digimentors. So what we're going to do, Walter is having a little difficulty joining the show um, uh, right now. So we're going to go ahead and uh, go through the paper and then wait for Walter to come back uh, before we talk about the um, uh, Black Panther and others. A few uh, other topics, a few of the other comments uh, that came in while we're uh, watching. Uh, let's see. Um, what, uh, what else do we have? Um, Ellen said, yay, the Senate. So now Georgia will be icing on the case. Nice, but not nail-bitingly crucial, but still important. And yes, Ellen, it is, it, there is, it is important. From a, a political perspective, we're dealing with Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema, who have not been reliable votes in the Senate. So having you know, that 51st vote will certainly help. Uh, right now, they, can, they hold uh, uh, the Democratic caucus hostage. Uh, which is uh, very challenging. Um, let's see. Uh, Linda says, love that double gatefold section on Pi. We'll certainly take a close look at that. Uh, Ellen is saying pecan is her favorite. Um, and uh, that it's amazing that with all going on, war in Ukraine, economy, et cetera, abortion became the most important issue in the elections. Um, it should be a personal choice, not a political gambit or a religious uh um issue taking over government absolutely um doug says i love the way the times uses design on the magazine cover what we uh showed earlier um and uh, patricia is asking about how i liked black panther i'm gonna wait until walter joins us so we can discuss that in full but i will tell you i did like the movie definitely well done uh want to say hello to mary c curtis joining from charlotte north carolina still running late after covering the midterms, um, the PBS Black Issues Forum and more. Uh, Ron Thomas is joining us from Dubai. Thank you, Ron. So let's go ahead and jump into the paper uh, while we wait for Walter to resolve the technical issues he's having. We certainly do want Walter to join us, but uh, it's definitely gonna be worth, to wait, worth the wait. Uh, so let's go back to the paper. And let's jump into the pie section, since that is a special. And we'll get back to the news in a little bit. So if you remember two weeks ago, we had um, uh, Wayne Camadoy on the show, and he gave us a preview. He talked about how long it took to put this together and all the work it takes in terms of the photography, the writing. They had to work with their uh, the print shop, Mike Connors, and work with print shops around the country to make sure this printed appropriately. Remember, the New York Times is printed at 27 print shops around the country. Mine is printed by the Washington Post. Uh, when I was in Seattle, it was printed by the Seattle Times. Um, so we will uh, take a look at that. And you know, when we flip through, so again, I'm gonna do a quick preview of you because for you, because I know Walter is with us backstage um, and this is going to be a lot to cover. The gatefold shows recipes on the outside, and then this is the inside. You're not going to be able to see it all with the uh, overhead cam that we have. I'll just show you a quick preview here. But when we get to it, I'll take out my, my cell phone, and we will do a proper showing of the pie section. But as I said, we're going to set that aside because our guest of honor is here, and we do not want to hold up this conversation about uh, Black Panther and other issues any longer. Uh, again, our guest is Walter Grayson, professor of history at McAllister College. And um, we are so thankful that he is able to join us. Walter, thank you for joining us. Morning, Neil. Sorry it's taken me a minute. New circumstances. This is just a, a brand new setup for me. Absolutely. You know, we'll take you any way we can get you, Walter. Um, as I mentioned in my Twitter thread, uh, this is your third time on the show. Uh, I remember, wow. was it? I was going to say, is this like Steve Martin on SNL? Is we're, there, I'm getting close. We're keeping track. It's it's a club. <laughs> Only a few people have had three. You and Tom Jolly 
uh, the print editor of the New York Times, um, and I believe Monica Drake, who was Sri's very Sri's very first guest when he started wow. the show seven years ago. She was the travel editor, and she has uh, gone on to join the masthead at the Times. Um, so that is pretty elite company. I'd have to look through my notes to see if anyone else has, has hit the three uh, three guest club um, with with you. But when when we first met, you know, we uh, started interacting on Twitter a little bit, and then I reached out and said, "Hey, can I tell you about this show called the New York Times? We'd love to have you for MLK Day." This was back in January 2020. Um, and then you came last, came back last year with Kay uh, Whitehead um, to do a special show. This was right after the Rittenhouse verdict last year, um, which was pretty incredible. And um, and now we have you for opening weekend of Wakanda Forever. I mean, it couldn't be better. It couldn't be better. This has been just the best. And I love the work that, that you do. And Sri has pioneered and just everyone needs to pay attention on Sunday morning to what's happening with the New York Times read along. It's just a brilliant, brilliant contribution. Thank you very much, Walter. Appreciate it. So we have been asking our guests, you know, over the last two and a half years, what, you know, their experience have been like over the pandemic and, and how have you, uh, you know, your first personally, your family, et cetera. We're hoping that everyone has been healthy. I know that during the pandemic, you moved, you had some uh, personal losses in terms of uh, family. Um, I'd like to, to twist that question just a little bit. We are sitting here in November of 2022, as I said, two and a half years after the pandemic. How is COVID playing out for you now at school, personally, uh, where are you with the, the pandemic? So my family was very um, aggressive <clears throat> about responding to pandemic protocols and, and protecting our, our two sons. Um, we put every tool at our disposal, um, wearing masks constantly through the first two years, um, eagerly waiting hoping for the, the vaccine sequence to be developed. Um, being at home in some ways made a lot of our day-to-day -day life a little easier. And I've heard this from, from a number of people in, in my social circles, is that um, the complexity of a commute plus the, the, comple the complexity of in-office personal relationships, professional relationships, um, things became a, a little simpler and easier to organize, particularly for folks who, who are confronted with issues of discrimination or harassment in their workplace on a regular basis. Um, those kinds of, of being able to work on your own terms from your own from your home through a device containing a lot of the kinds of um, misunderstandings, I'll be charitable, um, and minimizing them. That that was a distinct feature of the, the first year to two years of COVID. And then as the vaccines came and people were very attentive to it, people continued to mask. That's when I started my, my job at McAllister was last August. And McAllister as an institution has just been extraordinary about protecting students, protecting staff and faculty. That every step to kind of make sure that the campus does not become uh, a site of a major event to, to spread COVID. It's been extraordinary. And so that's that's been my experience here in Minnesota. The attention to detail has been just unbelievable. And then to, to then enter the, the election cycle, still dealing with kind of long COVID. Um, I'll be up front, I have some health issues that, that make it particularly sensitive for me to deal with. So every day there's, there's a real routine about caring for my respiratory system to make sure that I don't get worse problems. But even so, you know, I, I've had complications that have been scary. And so in some ways, I'm, I'm very lucky <laughs> to be here on the call with you today. And, and COVID has been terrifying fundamentally. And um, I wish more people, I wish everybody would talk openly and, and talk about how seriously they take it. Uh, thank you, Walter. Uh, we, we're with you right there. You know, uh, we went out to see Black Panther yesterday. Uh, we wore masks. Um, we, uh, we're not, uh, you know, taking chances. I've had, <clears throat> excuse me, 
my I have relatives uh, in New Jersey uh, who are who are older. Uh, they're in their 80s. Who the whole family got COVID. I mean, there are two couples that that live together. Uh, it's still it's still an issue. We have friends in Seattle. Um, a uh, a single mom who just texted us that she got COVID yesterday. Um, it's still out there. It's still uh, impacting people. And, you know, whether, you know, it, it's part of this whole issue this, with this return to work and this return to normalcy, if you will, um, there are people who are still vulnerable. There are people who are uh, like yourself who have to worry about health uh, issues. Um, so I, I certainly am not taking, uh, you know, kind of my uh, uh, foot off the gas in terms of COVID protections, and, and I'm glad that McAllister has been a supportive environment uh, for you. Uh, I do want to uh, note Ron Thomas, uh, our friend from Dubai, uh, said the professor is in the house, uh, which is uh, you know absolutely true. And again, we're so glad that you were able to join us. Patricia uh, mentioned that she remembered that episode. I'm not sure whether it was the first one I mentioned, the, the MLK episode or the um, uh, the one last year, but certainly uh, she says, welcome back, uh, Walter. Um, and our friend Apollo uh, says hello from Philadelphia. So uh, I remember Apollo was uh, watching that Rittenhouse uh, episode in particular. Home of the 8 no Philadelphia Eagles. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, let's, let's jump into it because uh, we want to, uh, you know, share with folks some of the uh, um, the brilliance that you have. How long have you been working on uh, Black Panther on Wakanda in, in from a uh, research perspective and advocacy perspective? It's part of your work on Afrofuturism, uh, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And so uh, 2002, 2003 is when I first got in email contact with uh, Christopher Priest. Uh, That's 20 formerly. years ago. <laughs> yes, I, I, I just want to point that out. Did the math real quickly. <laughs> Twenty years ago, you've been working on this. All right. Yeah, uh, Priest had, had published the first six issues of a relaunch under the Marvel Knights imprint of Black Panther. Um, and I was just talking to somebody about this this morning that uh, the character struggled for readership and popularity for for most of its existence. And so there are very few really Black Panther stories done compared to um, Superman or Batman or the Avengers. And so, um, and even in the Avengers, there's a reference to Black Panther always being in the background and kind of not having a lot of lines. And so um, Priest really reinvented the character in the early 2000s. And when I reached out to him, because I saw the kind of trajectory of what he was creating, I wanted him to really develop the idea of Wakanda and, and make it a fully fleshed out nation. And our first conversations were a lot about religion because Priest was a, is a Baptist minister. And so talking about faith in the context of Wakanda was really a huge starting point. And those conversations, you know, comic book writers and editors, you know, don't get to talk to academic folks very often. And so that, that set of conversations continued to evolve until um, Reginald Hudlin took over the book. And um, he had a, a specific cinematic vision and so on his websites, we were able to develop uh, essentially an initial Bible or encyclopedia about the Black Panther and Wakanda. And it became a tremendous resource for all the staff and the writers at Marvel. And many more stories flowed out of it after Hudlin um, kind of offered that material. And then from there, we, it was like a year later, we saw that the Iron Man movie was so successful and everyone involved became very excited that this was gonna be, at some point, we thought it might be a couple decades, but there was gonna be a Black Panther movie one day. And so uh, flash forward 10 years to 2016, the character shows up in uh, Captain America Civil War. I uh, pulled together the Wakanda syllabus that was based on all of the tools and a lot more that had emerged in Afrofuturism. And that set the table for people understanding and, and valuing um, how Ryan Coogler and Hannah Beachler um, put together this extraordinary visual experience in 2018. Um, for me, I had been a part in 2017 of the Encyclopedia of Black Comics, where I wrote about Christopher Priest. Then um, my book on, that's titled Cities Imagined 
came out right before the movie dropped and it's its fourth chapter spells out the urban design of Wakanda. It's the only academic book to really provide how that concept, how the concept of Wakanda as a nation in its major cities developed. And so that, that work has now taken over a giant chunk of my academic life. Um, I've done museum exhibits in uh, New York and Philadelphia and new exhibits have come out in San Francisco and Los Angeles. Uh, the team of Afrofuturists who we featured on the syllabus are now, in real terms, international celebrities. They, they travel constantly talking about all the work that, that makes this, this set of stories so exciting. And so it's not just about Wakanda. It's, it's about the idea of Black intellectual life and creativity, art, music, literature, politics. A lot of my work is in urban design and economics, and so that's, that's my particular kind of role. In, in the in the team that we have, but that work is is shaped by the Wakanda syllabus. It's evolved now four times. It's hosted by McAllister. I taught a course last fall based on it, and the students created a lot of new work. And you're so, teaching again uh, next fall as well. Next fall as well be another course. And so this this is so large. It's 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 far beyond anything we imagined <laughs> just having kind of back and forth phone calls and emails 20 years ago. And so, um, yeah, with this movie and, and its potential success, uh, it's a much different, it was a much harder story. I think I know the pain for uh, Nate Moore and Ryan Coogler was uh, deep and profound and, and you feel it as an audience going, going through the film. Um, but even that's part of the way it all to... evolves referring to Chadwick Boseman's uh, passing and, and having to evolve the story. Uh, certainly no one uh, could have predicted that or, or planned for that. Um, but they, but they found a way to, to make it work. Um, I want to just point out Paula is sharing links uh, in Facebook to your website, uh, right. to cities imagined uh, and also to the encyclopedia of black comics, uh, all uh, items that you referenced earlier. Mm -hmm. If you fast forward, you talked about you know, having started work on this, you know, 20 years ago and putting this in the context of Afrofuturism. Um, your most recent uh, piece that I saw uh, is why the Black Panther multiverse is more than entertainment. Um, can you can you bring bring your work up to the present day uh, and particularly this second installment? I think you also made reference to a potential or hopeful third installment in the uh the series um oh, is yeah. this every i mean could you have imagined the impact that blank black panther had ha would have on uh society you know the first edition much less uh with chadwick's uh passing and and having to reinvigorate the uh franchise no this this it's a little bit complicated to explain, but I, I'll, I'll take a minute to say we were in Harlem at the uh, Schomburg Library in the New York Public Library system prior to the first film coming out. And as excited as I think there were maybe 20 or 30 of us involved in the Wakanda syllabus that were there, and we all thought it would do well. None of us imagined the level of the response which just continued viewing, repeated kind of the theatrical tickets purchased that over the next year and a half, the awards it would win worldwide, um, that that was all a tremendously gratifying healing experience given the amount of time and work that had gone into everything. And so beyond that, as we came into this film, one of the most profound impacts I saw was that architects began to study forms of African historic architecture and Caribbean architecture and design and imagine a sustainable world um, that's not predicated on colonialism and segregation and enslavement. And so the uh, Journal of the Society of Academic of, of Architectural Historians uh, published uh, an article on how black architects and their history had the knowledge that we needed to build a more sustainable world. And that is actually moving very quickly forward. I have a number of students and graduate students and new faculty who are advancing that work. Uh, the article was entitled Reconstructions. 
And so it's intentional play on the history of reconstruction in the 19th century, but also the need to really rethink and rebuild places that are impacted by climate change and, and really rethink how we finance and, and how we discuss kind of treaty obligations. The, the real shape of our world in this century is, is going to be impacted by the ideas that come out of Wakanda forever. And I will tell you, in the, before I saw the film, I, I knew how uh, potentially devastating um, the experience of watching Wakanda forever would be. Just from the flashes of the flooding in the capital city, and I know for me, it triggered enormous kind of sense of um, just terror, um, both from Hurricane Katrina and from Superstorm Sandy. Sure. And so, you know, like anyone who, who has seen the film knows that when, when the city is flooded, it is it leads to maybe the most devastating moment in the film. And so that process, I think, is intentional, by, certainly by, by Kugler, to talk about the, the kinds of devastation we can face in our lives and, and potentially can see going forward in, in this century if we don't adapt very rapidly. And that piece about resilience and, and struggle and how do we kind of defy the odds to overcome, especially in, in the wake of this last Tuesday's election when we faced real fascism on the rise in this country and to be able to turn that back, we have a chance. We have a chance to do something very extraordinary in the next two years, in the next decade. And so I hope people stay charged up and say they stay very excited and see the kind of closing joy that comes out of this film that really is about all of us giving birth to a new world, to a new kind of human civilization going forward in this century. One thing I wanted to um, uh, ask you about, and, and Miriam says it's fascinating how Black Panther has inspired architects. Uh, absolutely, Miriam, couldn't couldn't agree more. One thing that was interesting about the film, and and even for folks, if you haven't watched it yet, you know, we'll we'll be careful not to share any spoilers. Um, but the uh, it's clear the um, um, this is the the review focusing on on women. Um, but the uh, what I wanted to pull up actually was the uh, the uh, the villain in this uh, in this movie. So uh, we'll just bring that up real quickly. Uh, Namor, uh, the uh, who, you know this article. Who is Namor, the Black Panther, uh, uh, Wakanda Forever wi villain? What's interesting to me is that um, you know, first of all, there it's this is a a longtime Marvel character, uh, Submariner, if I'm not mistaken, uh, back in the 30s uh, that it was he was first written in. Um, but he's, and I don't know if this is part of the original story, but he's portrayed and his people are portrayed as Mesoamerican in, in their um, heritage. And the actor himself is, uh, uh, has an indigenous background as an, as an activist, is very vocal one thing that I was uh, struck by, Walter, in, in terms of the overall arc of the show, um, you have, I, I break it down into terms of three groups. You have Wakanda, you have um, uh, Telecon. This, uh, Telecon, right? Uh, and you have uh, the representation of the Western world, the US, uh, France, uh, the United Nations, et cetera. As, as three different poles. Um, most of this this story is actually pitting brown versus black. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, that in the, in the two screenings I've seen, that, that was the sharpest, most kind of difficult struggle was the conflict that emerges between Wakanda and, and Talokan. There's there's a little bit to unpack. I, I am hesitant. Everyone loves to call him Namor, but the way the movie kind of explains, he Not literally more. says, um, my enemies call me Namor. So I, I'm inclined to call him Kuk Ulkan. Kuk Ulkan. Ulkan, yes. uh, which is what his people call him. Yes. Um, and this is one of the gifts for me. And um, it's just profound to see the same principles applied 
to indigenous culture in this film and an indigenous kind of emerging emerging Chicanx or, or Latinx mm -hmm. culture. This is, uh, I went to New Zealand in 2019 to do a talk about Afrofuturism and the, and the digital design tools that I'm making about changing our framework to understand how we, we do education. And in New Zealand, the Maori people, mm -hmm. their language is taught in elementary school. And the fact that all children understand indigenous language and have a way of thinking about their world through, through those basic forms of expression. I came back to North America and was like, we need to do this here. We, we need to have some exposure to indigenous language in the United States and Canada and especially Mexico. And so those are a simple statement. It's a simple tweak to make. We have the voices of indigenous people who are all around us, but bringing them to the center in the way that the film does. When, when Kukulan basically begins to articulate the threat to, to his world and how his people have had to adapt and survive, um, there's an enormous sense of how to rethink ourselves and, and look at ourselves differently in the mirror through, through the eyes and through the voice that he presents. And so for me, um, at the end of my first multi-site exhibit about Afrofuturism was titled Afrofuturist Design. Because of the New Zealand experience, I came back and said, we, we must understand indigenous design. We must understand the ways that the people who are indigenous in the different lands around the world could have provided us a better template for creating the ways that we live right now. And so increasingly, I'm, I'm seeing this not just in Wakanda Forever, but I also think of the, uh, the Predator story on Hulu that was called Prey. It's about a conflict between French colonizers and the indigenous people, I believe it's uh, Lakota or Dakota, the Sioux on the Central Plains and, and this alien predator. And they shot most of the movie in indigenous language. Like you can actually watch it. Um, in, in this in a different language so that you can actually hear it and know the vitality of the culture and the life. And it, it's just brilliant. And I'm, I'm excited to see more of that coming forward, that it's important to have different kinds of Africa diaspora, African diaspora expression. It's very important to have different kinds of Latinx expression. But indigenous culture, I think, is, is a fundamental piece of this as we, we change the kinds of institutions and societies that, that we live in. I'm showing on the, the screen uh, a New York Times spotlight page on Black Panther. Shows some of the coverage, the, the main review focusing on women, uh, uh, women's roles in uh, Wakanda Forever. Um, the article about uh, uh, Namor that we were just talking about. Um, the, an article about the soundtrack and the collaborations they did for that. And then also what I thought was interesting, they, they have another article specifically looking at other coverage of Black Panther in Variety, in Wired, et cetera, sort of a review of that. I uh, wanted to make sure that uh, folks know that gift links to all of these stories are on our website. Uh, so if you go to digimentors.group slash blog and find uh, the episode with Walter, you'll find gift links to these four articles if you're interested, if you don't have a subscription to the Times. Uh, Walter, I want to move on from uh, Black Panther. We certainly could be talking about this for the whole show. Um, but the other big uh, topic we wanted to cover uh, is Twitter. Um, and uh, this specific thread that you posted uh, earlier in the week, um, it took me a few days to realize it, but what we are seeing on Twitter uh, is an example of counter convergence. It is happening across media platforms and I've seen miniature versions of it for a few years. Briefly, can you sum up what, what this dynamic is that you're seeing? This is referring to Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter and the impact it's having on various communities. Certainly, certainly. So um, part of what brought me uh, into the way that Black Panther was being constructed was this idea in media studies that uh, convergence of media institutions and platforms was happening through the first decade of the 21st century. 
that unlike broadcast media or even cable media at the center of what we understood as information and communication systems, uh, over the last 40 years of the 20th century, convergence combines the way that print media, um, radio, uh, television and movies all coordinated their messaging so that it would have the deepest, uh, most profound impact on, on the reading, viewing, listening audience. And so it was that co coordination that folks who are critical media analysts were seeing. Um, and I mentioned in the thread things like Harry Potter. The main example I study is The Matrix. Um, how did these become social phenomenon? Because they coordinated multiple kinds of platforms. And so this unfolded, uh, a lot of the people who replied talked about the Obama campaign in 2008, using social media in conjunction with so much of the other kinds of platforms to actually bring uh, obscure junior senator, as he says himself, with an unusual name uh, to the presidency. And so then there's a response in 2016, and a um, good colleague from mine from London also mentioned that this was also about Brexit that conservative institutions began to see the danger of convergence and the way that popular movements, grassroots movements, were using them to change discourse. And of course, I think about Black Lives Matter in this context, that their work to kind of change how the world looked at these issues culminates in an event like the response to George Floyd being murdered here in Minneapolis. And so this is changing the sense of what politics can do and the way societies could function. The counter convergence is the coordination of very wealthy interests. And um, I'd written a, written a previous essay about the ancillary moment almost 150 years ago, where uh, in the 1880s, Congress shifted the definition of property away from farming and plantations to protect banks and corporate industrial corporations. We're in that same kind of moment now. And this is part of what the Federal Reserve is doing is shifting the idea of what kind of property we protect. And so the moment of having inflation and potentially a recession in 2023 is about deciding which kinds of major private corporate institutions are going to shape the coming decades. So um, what's happening with Elon Musk and Twitter, what's happening with Netflix, um, you're seeing similar issues with Facebook and with Google. CNN, um, MSNBC. Yes, indeed. They are they are retrenching and redesigning how they're going to use their capacity going forward. And so it serves multiple interests. It is basically designing what we're going to see argued on these platforms as normal, what, what our new normal is going to be in the next 15 to 20 years. And so had a number of the election deniers won on Tuesday night um, and through the kind of recounts that we're seeing or or continuing counts that we're seeing, um, that would have been a major pillar of the world that we see for the next couple decades, that it would have been about less free expression. It would have been about fewer rights for women. Um, we are still seeing the, the coordinated assault to diminish anti-discrimination protections. And so these these dialogues are not just abstract. These are, these are literally about what will become policy that people who are 20 are going to have to live with it for most of their careers. Um, that people who are just being born today will know nothing different and come to expect that that's the way the world should be. So that's what I pay attention to are, are kind of macro social, macroeconomic shifts in this particular piece of counter convergence. And just because there's a, a kind of political turn against some of some of the trends that I describe in the thread doesn't mean that it's over. Mm -hmm. um, there has to be a sustained effort to pay attention to this framework and to continue to organize for greater justice, for more freedom, for you know, anti-authoritarianism. The struggle in Ukraine is is really the front line here, is that if if European and, and NATO and allied forces can win in supporting that nation, it's a fundamental geopol geopolitical shift that then opens the door for greater opportunity, for greater freedom going forward. And it, it 
it means a weaker place in the world for Russia. It means a different kind of way of participating for China. And so those are the kinds of big things, big topics that are on the table for the next two years. And um, hopefully we can, we can negotiate them, overcome the kinds of um, attempts that Elon Musk is doing to be very selfish and to dismantle a vibrant platform like Twitter. Um, but we have to fight for it every day and, and we can't seed ground um, in the course of this, this negotiation. I want to give a shout out to our friend Pradnia Haldapur, who is joining late, but she's in Sharm el-Sheikh for the COP27 uh, meetings, the uh, uh, climate meetings, uh, which I know we'll be covering in uh, the paper when we get to it. Mm. Uh, I do have a, a question out to folks on the uh, on the ticker. Are you staying on Twitter? Why or why not? Uh, Walter, as you say here, um, it's too important to casually abandon this work but you will need to limit your participation until this is fundamentally broken or at least hobbled. Uh, we know that uh, Sri wrote about this as well in his um, Sri Sunday note, the Elon Musk era begins at Twitter. Uh, he wrote that earlier in the week and he says he's staying on Twitter as well for now. Uh, certainly encourage folks to check out Sri's uh, Sunday note. You can find it uh, at srinet.substack.com, srinet.substack.com. Uh, I think that a lot of the, this conversation around Twitter um, is is really what people's experiences. Uh, I think that there is a very wide range of experiences on Twitter from people, you know, for women in particular and, and people of color, um, people who are, um, you know, certainly much more active, but it's also a question of how you use Twitter. If you are relying on Twitter to serve up, uh, content based on the algorithm, that's one thing. But if you're using lists and curating your content very carefully, um, and you can also limit who replies to your tweets. If you're concerned about people jumping in, into your thread or into your, your replies, uh, you can restrict your DMs. I, I mean, I don't know if uh, you know, people have had challenges, have used all the tools and found a way to make it work. Um, but for now, there is there are so many really important conversations going on Twitter. I know I can't uh, abandon it. Um, there's there's just there's too much going on. And I actually try and I effectively stay away from a lot of the vitriol and uh, and, and craziness that's out there. Um, Mary Curtis is sharing Black Twitter elevated the platform. I share solidarity with other Black women of color who write columns and speak on politics. Uh, absolutely. Mary, I'd, I'd be curious as someone who is very active on Twitter, uh, what your experience has been, um, you know, with the intersectionality, both as a woman and uh, uh, someone who is Black. Um, has Twitter been a space um of of uh of comfort for you in terms of being able to find community and share or has it you know made it easier for the trolls to come at you uh trolls have always been there uh unfortunately whether you know someone who has been on tv and and in the media i'm sure mary can can share you know all someone has to do is pick up the phone and uh you know call the studio or send a email send a letter they're going to get you. I think that social media makes it easier for people to reach out. Um, and she says, I get the haters, but I also get support and comfort. Um, Walter, what are what are your thoughts on that? So I, I'm very aggressive and have been about curating all social media that I participate in. Um, my four pl primary platforms have been uh, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and I would say probably Instagram. Um, always need to cultivate my YouTube more, so I'm very grateful <laughs> for our chances to do work like this. But um, those platforms, when you're very thoughtful and, and you use the controls, can clean up a lot of it. My concern has been, um, I think of Imani Perry, who is a colleague mm -hmm. at Princeton, who was uh, hacked and done in such a way that it made it very confusing to disentangle who was responsible and how to restore access to her account. And this was right after I put out the uh, counter convergence thread. Yeah. Like in less than 24 hours. And so I, I worry about the information security at this point. And so, so many 
of my colleagues have locked their accounts to kind of preserve their audience and then they're working daily to take their threads and to preserve them as PDFs so that the knowledge they generated sure. will be more portable. Sure. Um, I am, I, I do use Facebook and LinkedIn less since issues like Cambridge Analytica broke. And I, I stayed active on Twitter despite that because of the nature of the community. I am moving Twitter towards the kind of <coughs> less frequent use, more protected use. Um, this happens as the election results are breaking, as Black Panther comes out um, and this tweet had gone viral. So it's delayed my my increased security on my account for a couple of days. But um, as you, among all of the folks that you see on that list, folk, folks like Ibram and Keisha, um, Hedrick, like they're amazing. I didn't even list the hundreds of other kinds of connections on this platform that I would lose if I left and make it much more difficult to kind of work with them and coordinate. So I can't, I can't let it go. And I have to just rethink how I make the best use of it. I can't tell you how, you know, just honored I was to be on this list with people like Nicole Hannah-Jones and Dr. Ibram Kendi, Soledad O'Brien. Uh, this is an example of Walter's generosity on Twitter. Uh, if you, if you're interacting with him, He's tagging people, he's sharing content, he's bringing people into the conversation. I'll say personally, I had 250 new followers just from this thread, Walter, uh, which is just incredible. You know, I did reply to the thread as well to, uh, to amplify that and retweet it. Um, but again, thank you. One of the things in terms of as we've, you know, we, we've gone a little bit away in terms of the read along, the show itself in its earlier years, we were, showing people how to use uh, Facebook Live. We were talking about the uh, the technical aspects of it and using it as teaching moments. Uh, I would like to, to try a little bit of that now uh, in real time. I haven't used it very much, but there is a function in Twitter called Twitter Communities. Uh, I joined this digital diplomacy one as a just as an experiment to see how it works. Um, if you haven't uh, tried Twitter Communities, Walter, my understanding is that that is a closed space in Twitter. So you can bring all of the folks that you want to interact with, uh, the, the K Whiteheads and, um, you know, social studies, uh, TX and uh, Joe Schmidt, et cetera, into this one group where you can talk to each other. Now, it does create that echo chamber, um, which is, you know, part of the challenge of Twitter because and, and social media, if you're only hearing from people you uh, agree with, you're not getting that exposure, but this does allow you to have those conversations uh, in a, what I presume is a safe space. Um, so I, I would say this, so that's great for folks who I know about, for folks who, who I'm already familiar correct. with. So much of my, my base Twitter account is the ability to retweet people who I'm unfamiliar with and sure. haven't seen before, and particularly folks who have certainly fewer than a thousand, oftentimes fewer than 500 followers who are sure. just trying to get up off the ground and figure out kind of how they connect and, and grow. Um, I think of a colleague named Ivo Hanen, who is in London, who has built up a massive European educational network or um, mm -hmm. Steve Sostak, who is in uh, Beijing, Sostak, sure. Sure. Um, doing the Inspire Citizens work on, on global sustainable de development. Um, there are so many folks who are out there who are not connected. And I think one of the most powerful things I saw maybe four or five years ago was uh, Twitter mapped my follower network. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing they showed me was that I had almost no bots, like 99.9% .9 of, of the folks in the list were, were actual people. They weren't verified. They're not blue check Twitter, but they're actual human beings that are out there doing work every single day. So that is by far the single most valuable thing I know about my network is that it's, it's real people. Sure. And then beyond that, it was ridiculous. Of course, 70 percent of the team comes from North America, the United States. But then there's there's substantial participation from over 200 countries, like more than 20 followers from 200 countries. And I'm still kind of speechless at the notion that there are folks who are in Mozambique who can come and contribute and share 
Uh, there are folks in the Philippines who follow and and connect and and offer, and and I know when it was coming to the instability and the invasion of Ukraine, to get folks from Eastern Europe, um, yep. from Poland, who were talking about the impact on the region, um, that sense of global connection is is really what I I hoped was possible in starting a Twitter account, and and I did never want to lose the kind of spontaneous surprise. Uh, tweet that comes my way <laughs> that like I want to like, make sure more people see it that it, I, I look at it I evaluate it and then decide yes I have to hit the retweet on this like that's a real process for me is okay what do I like why do I like it and then what do I retweet and what is the consequence of me hitting retweet so that's a that's a daily process for me and it, it is a thing like now the sponsored content the promoted content um, is increasing and yeah. it's obscuring yeah. a lot of the folks that I'm really there, that I'm listening for, that I'm watching for. Certainly. So that's that's the big piece for me about kind of securing my account is trying to keep some connection to the broader world that is is endlessly fascinating, but also protecting the people that I've come to just cherish as part of my life. I want to bring in Ron's comment. Uh, this show is such a learning experience. Uh, thank you, Ron. Really appreciate that. Ron is a former guest on this show. Um, in fact, I think he may have been a guest the week before you were on, Walter, January 20th. I'd have to look back in the archives, but I think he was. Uh, I know that he was at uh, Sri's place. Uh, it's possible that he was on the year before as well. I'd have to check uh, my notes. Uh, Amber Coleman Murphy, um, Mortley rather, uh, mom of all capes on Twitter. Um, I am rooting for the platform. I really love Twitter. I'm noting that that's in the past tense. I'm not, I haven't read the rest of the comment yet. I noticed that's in the past tense. Folks like Walter continue to inspire me and my kids work, but man, oh man. Um, Amber, are you staying on Twitter? That's, that's the big question that, that people are, are asking. Um, and, and I will say if folks are considering leaving Twitter. Um, and, you know, Walter, we could uh, uh, chat about this for a little bit. And Amber is thinking about leaving. If you're thinking about leaving, I would encourage you and, and this advice that I saw uh, come across my feed, don't delete your account. What I would recommend is you can make it private, change your bio to point people to where uh, they can find you. Uh, but don't give up your username. Because if you do, someone else could snatch it up. I'm not sure if someone else would think of using mom of all capes. Uh, but I know, for example, for myself, Neil Parik, I'm, I'm very happy to have gotten Neil Parik. On LinkedIn, I have Neil Parik 1, because I guess I was a step behind. But uh, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, it's all at Neil Parik. If I left, someone else would take up that uh, that mantle, and all of my old tweets would be associated with their account. Um, Walter, you went through this uh, yourself. You switched. Your moniker has been World Professor, and you still use that. Um, that was your Twitter handle before you changed it to Walter D. Grayson. Um, how did that impact your your Twitter presence uh, in terms of your 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 name? So uh, it was actually interesting. It, when I first came to Twitter, it was literally World Professor One. There was a number at the end of it. And so I would say up until about 8,000 followers, that that was what was there. And then um, someone, I think it, it was it was a foreign actor, uh, took World Professor and was essentially mirroring my content and, oh, wow. and trying to like siphon away followers. So uh, that's what caused me to shift to just World Professor. I, I dealt with that through Twitter and, and got that taken over. Um, and they moved. They migrated all my World Professor One content to the World Professor, and it was it was fine. Um, ultimately, <laughs> the goal was to build a Twitter account that had global reach. And so once that was done, I, I, I'll be frank. My, my academic colleagues would tease me <laughs> and be like, hey, World Professor. World Professor, right? Yeah. <laughs> And so they were kind of laughing at me behind my back and then just kind of getting in my face about it. So um, I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll just convert it to my name. But yeah, the world professor as as a phrase, you know, sticks and, and yeah. people 
connect with it. And so, you know, I, I now just have it as part of the, the also known as on, on my name, but part like, of your name, but it still impacts in terms of searching and tagging. If you know, old content, like the last two times you were on the show, you actually switched it right after our show last year. Uh, to, so all of the tweets mention that world professor, but they go to a different uh, person. Uh, oh, it's just no. a cautionary tale in terms of how, you know, you need to be careful with what you're doing on Twitter. And if, again, for folks who are thinking about leaving, don't just delete your account, lock it down, put something in the in the bio saying, this is where you can find me. I'm leaving Twitter, but I'm on LinkedIn, et cetera. Uh, but don't give up your, your name because there is value, uh, real value in that. Uh, Apollo says, I'm staying on Twitter. It's my place for so many in so many conversations. I do have a Mastodon account, but the platform seems to be a lot of work. I'll, I'll admit I have tried. I tried logging into Mastodon and trying figuring out, and I couldn't uh, make heads or tails of it uh, on the first go. So when I have a little more time, I'll see what I can uh, do with that. Uh, Walter, thank you for spending so much time talking about Black Panther and Twitter. Uh, we definitely went into a lot of detail, but I think that every now and then, it's worth it to really dig in and take the time to understand these issues. What I'd like to do is to switch our attention to the New York Times um, and um, you know look at what's in the paper. And uh, we will now talk about the news, as it were. Uh oh. Yeah, we need to get back to that pie page. I, I missed. I'm sorry I interrupted that. Neil, if you can hear me, we can't hear you. Situation. There we go. Turned over. Now you can hear me. Yes. Um, so what I want to do is to show the full glory of this uh, special section. You saw the front page here um, with several pies, apple, pecan, pumpkin, lemon meringue. Uh, I want to ask people again what their favorite pie is. Um, and then when you open it up, you see recipes on the inside, right? And then when you open it up folder, it's a gatefold. You kind of open up both sides. And you have this, can't even fit it on my, my space that I've set up for the show. Uh, these pie pieces, according to Wayne, are almost life-size in terms of the size of the pies. You have, we have maple cream pie. Let's take a look at this closer. Oh, whoops, it flipped on me. Um, maple cream pie. Um, we have uh, custard pie in the middle here. Blackberry apple pie. Eggnog sweet potato pie. I've never heard of that one. Chocolate and peanut butter pie. Spiced pumpkin cheesecake. Caramel apple pie. Cranberry lemon meringue. And pecan sandy pie. So they went all out on this one. Um, and it's their their tagline on the, uh, the front is apple pecan pumpkin, lemon meringue, they're all here as you've never seen them before. Walter, what's your uh, pie tradition for Thanksgiving? Oh, definitely sweet potato. Definitely, definitely sweet, sweet potato. potato. Huh? You know, the, the, the apple also coming from New Jersey's kind of like farm belt where there's nothing but orchards. Uh, the apple pies are absolutely spectacular. Shout out to delicious orchards in Holmdale, uh, Holmdale New Jersey, Colts Neck, New Jersey. Man, 
best stuff you could ever have. Order it from all over the world. <laughs> they are just spectacular. Mm. But I saw that eggnog sweet potato in there. I'm like, man, okay, who does that? I need somebody to send me a little sample of the eggnog sweet potato. That's the slice of the eggnog sweet potato, uh, <laughs> from what I can tell. Um, let's see. Uh, Amber says she was asking, where's the sweet potato pie? Their sweet potato. That's the eggnog sweet potato. Mary Curtis says, I'm with you. Perfected my pie crust from scratch during the Ooh. pandemic. Um, wow. Apollo's favorite is lime pie. Um, so that is, that's certainly interesting. Patricia likes the pumpkin pie. Um, and uh, Patricia saying great visual and color of the pies. Absolutely. Ellen look great pecan and chocolate, but wouldn't turn down anyone except pumpkin pie. Yuck pumpkin. Um, Ellen, I have to say, I agree with you there. I'm not a fan of, of the pumpkin pie uh, myself. Um, and Paula is reminding folks that we have the PDF for the um, for this special section in uh, the blog post for uh, Walter's show. So you can take a look at this in more detail. Uh, we also have <clears throat> in the Twitter thread, and I'll add it to the website afterward, uh, I have the, the clip from Wayne talking about this special pie section. They spend uh, a good deal of time laying this out, working with the printers, making sure this comes out just right. Um, again, you can see the way that um, they do the, um, uh, the design. So you have the recipes on the outside flaps. Um, I also think, pay, let's pay attention to the ads as well. No matter how you slice it, it's spectacular Broadway entertainment, Disney on Broadway. And their ads are what? The Lion King, Aladdin. And what is that in the corner there? What? Can't quite tell, Walter. What do you think? Uh, Elsa? Maybe. Um, frozen? Maybe. Frozen, yeah. Could be Frozen. That would make sense. Good call. It's been a, it's Frozen is so off my mind now. You know, Emily is probably three years removed. She recently got rid of all her frozen stuff. So um, <laughs> definitely it looks like Elsa to me. Um, and, and there's also, if we recall, uh, the front page of the paper had a Disney ad as well. Let's go to that. Um, the Lion King ad. So a little tie in there. Mm. Um, but that is the, uh, the, um, and then the back page is a full page ad. Um, for this special. So you're seeing, and you're right. So if I'd gone to the back page, that would have been much more easier to figure out. <laughs> Aladdin, the Lion King, Frozen, now playing on Broadway and on tour nationwide. Um, this looks, I don't know if you can tell, that looks like a blueberry. That must be a pecan, I'm mm. guessing. This might yeah. be blueberry as well. Yep. In the bottom corner. Um, well, it's all delicious. More pies. <laughs> Exactly. Um, my uh, Eric is saying hi from Ottawa, Ontario. Eric, thank you for joining us. Hey. My mom loves pecan pie. Um, and uh, Ellen says, of course, I don't like pumpkin. I have great taste. Uh, so she's doubling down on the yuck pumpkin. Um, let's see. And Amber was guessing Hook or Peter Pan with Tinkerbell, but obviously we figured out it was frozen. Um, and... Uh, and Patricia just saying thank you to the entire read along team for awesome discussions, folks. We are just getting going today. Um, in terms of the paper, we had a great conversation with Walter earlier, and we went straight to dessert uh, in terms of talking about the uh, the content. Um, but let's go ahead and take a look at what we have in uh, the paper uh, today. One thing I want to uh, point out uh, is that we have the um, I'll put the pies to the side. Um, page two and page three. I want folks to take a close look at this because we spend time with this every week. Um, page two has the insider uh, inside the times uh, article, which I always like. This is about getting personal with readers. When uh, writers insert themselves into the story, they don't do it very often, only when it's uh, necessary. And, and you can sometimes see references you know, they re refer to themselves in the third person. Very, very rarely do you see first person references. But you have the Inside the Times here. You have um, the Of Interest section, uh, which 
highlights uh, different things in the paper to draw you in. S the spotlight, the conversation, you have the service journalism down here, here to help. How to salvage a workout after a bad night of sleep. Uh, so for folks who work out a lot, this is certainly uh, relevant. Um, but what I wanted to point out is that from my conversations with uh, uh, Tom Jolly and uh, Wayne Cambadori, there are changes in the works for pages A2 and A3. Uh, and I believe that they will take place later this week. Our next show is actually going to be um, December 5th. Dan Barry is going to be our guest. Um, so we will definitely take a look at that for the first time. And, and if we can get more insights on the changes to A2 and A3, we will certainly do that. But I want to give you a heads up. Dan Barry, a longtime writer and reporter and columnist for The New York Times, will be our guest. We're taking two weeks off um, and returning December 5th. Uh, the international story I mentioned earlier, climate change and human activity erode Egypt's antiquities. Um, Pradnya Haldapur, uh, as we mentioned earlier, is in Sharm el Sheikh for the COP27 meetings, the um, climate uh, meetings out there. Uh, and I, as folks may know, I lived in Egypt for two years uh, in 03 to 05. Um, so this is certainly interesting to see this. I'll take a look at this later. But then there's also this article, Rarity in Egypt, Open Protest at the UN Climate Summit. Um, so that's certainly there. I know that they're protesting both climate change and also a specific um, political dissident who has been detained. So really curious about how that is playing out um, overseas. Um, we've talked a lot about abortion uh, rights here in the U.S., uh, but in uh, Benin, a year after widening abortion access, uh, Benin sees fewer botched ones. Uh, which is not surprising. That's certainly, you know, what the uh, story here is in terms of uh, after Roe v. Wade was decided, um, the, the safety of, of women who were uh, trying to get abortion certainly uh, improved. And uh, that's the big concern with the changes going forward. We've already seen people having to travel, et cetera, um, to get the care they need. Uh, two article, two pages about the uh, war in Ukraine. Um, and an article about uh, Biden and uh, Xi in uh, China. Um, we'll keep going. So here's an interesting, um, we'll always take a look at the ads. This is the centerfold ad, uh, Dr. Barbara Sturm, Love Your Skin, skincare backed by 25 years of anti-inflammatory science. And on the left, it's a doctor's note, um, almost like a prescription. Just interesting in terms of the messaging and the layout. Uh, here's that article. I don't know if you're familiar with this, Walter. This um, article about a UK prosecution tactic hits black people disproportionately. Um, they said they realized there was a new test uh, to apply to it, but that wasn't going to prevent people from being prosecuted. I'm not familiar with this uh, tactic. Are you? Uh... So I'd seen a few tweets about it maybe a week ago is this ability. And, and we have a similar thing is that if you're, say, in a car and someone else commits a crime, you can be then charged as a, as a co-conspirator. Mm -hmm. And it's led to just horrendous increases in prison population. And, and one of my students, uh, Caitlin Taylor, is is an expert on this work uh she she does brilliant work every day on how to actually globally change the culture of uh, law enforcement and criminal justice um generally it's, it can't be seen as a form of social control we have to really engage and and her specialty is rehabilitation how do we get people who have been sent to prison from from reoffending? but um these kinds of stories where we dramatically increase the number of people. I mean, we're, we're familiar here in the United States. And sure. Think about somebody like Khalif Browder, you know, this just tragedy and, and, and sometimes horrific consequences that come from this, this kind of project. This is, and this is the description here called joint enterprise, a legal principle that gives prosecutors the power to charge multiple people with a single crime, as you were describing. But it, it is, to me, it's impressive in terms of the layout the prominence that they gave this story inside with this really dominant photo 
and then also a box on data and methodology in the bottom right corner. Um, so that's worth worth noting. Uh, the national story, Hurricane Fiona leaves some Puerto Ricans living on the edge. Um, we have a new sense of home for a Ukrainian family living in Michigan. Uh, on the left-hand side here, um, internal documents. This is a continuation of story from the front page. Show how close FBI came to deploying spyware. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then some articles about the elections. And as we noted from the front page, with the Democrats winning in Nevada, they hold a Senate, um, at least now with the tiebreaker. We'll see what happens in uh, Georgia. Um, and uh, the House is still too close to call. Some of the uh, predictions are that they'd have it by one. The Republicans might lead by one seat, uh, but we will see how that goes. This is more of the election coverage. One of the things that was interesting, uh, Walter, in terms of the dy dynamics, you know, a diverse uh, set of candidates won across the board. You had Wes Moore as the only the third black governor um, r winning in Maryland. Um, you have uh, um, a number of women, a number of uh, younger uh, candidates. Gen Z was represented. Um, but at the same time, uh, you do have uh, Stacey Abrams losing in Georgia after a second yeah. uh, try there. This, this um, is tremendously important to look at the patterns and trends coming out of the 2022 election. It's one of the most unusual midterms in the, in the last two generations. And so I, I think back to a 2011 column I wrote in uh, Pennsylvania on um, changing the demographics of Congress and getting more women leaders, especially in the House and the Senate. Um, that as we increase the number of women leaders, particularly who are less ideological, who are willing to find space to compromise, we would actually have better governance. And this election, I'm hopeful, will, will showcase that going into next year. The House control is going to be tremendously important. I have folks who are looking at forecasts next year of a, of a real debt crisis. Um, if Kevin McCarthy becomes Speaker of the House, or, or really if the Republicans take majority, but beyond that, I think having a much more diverse representation is wonderful. At the same time, as we see with uh, Stacey Abrams, with the uh, North Carolina Senate race, uh, Val Demings in Florida, the, the hesitancy to stand behind black women in, in significant numbers, especially by white voters, um, is, is very, it, it strangles our, our society. It, it prevents us from having the best um, kind of leadership that includes all voices. And I think this is also true for, for indigenous women. We see uh, Deb Holland in the, um, in the Department of the Interior, but we need thousands of more indigenous men and women in, in federal leadership to kind of change the way we think about governance. So very, very important election to not allow greater kind of totalitarianism to kind of take hold here. But we're, we're still a long way from really embracing people who, who can move our society forward and, and, and make it so that we're successful, more successful in the 21st, even 22nd century. Absolutely. Um, I want to uh, just offer a correction on the date. Our next show is December 4th, not December 5th. Uh, December 5th is the Monday for that week. Uh, again, our guest today has been Walter Grayson. Uh, thank you so much, Walter, for your insights uh, on uh, Black Panther and on uh, Twitter, social media, talking about the elections as well. We want to make a few quick announcements and then bring you back on uh, to offer a pro tip to journalists um, and uh, you know, give any guidance you can offer. And, and you can think of this as broadly as you want. Uh, whether you uh, want to think about uh, folks writing about Twitter, writing about Black Panther, or about other issues that you have been covering. So we'll give you a quick break uh, as we make some announcements. Again, we want to give a shout out to Paula Kiger, uh, the unseen member of our production team. We'll get her on camera at some point, I'm sure. Um, you see Sri and myself uh, in the chair uh, usually uh, on uh, Sundays, but Paula is doing a, a lot of work behind the scenes on Facebook and LinkedIn 
uh, adding links, adding context, engaging with the audience. Thank you for that, uh, Paula. Uh, we also want to recognize our longtime sponsor, Muckrack, uh, for their support for the show. Uh, we always appreciate uh, your help uh, and remind you that this show is produced by Digimentors, the social and digital consulting firm that Sri and Andrew Lee started. We produce virtual and hybrid events, do social and digital consulting, trainings, and workshops. Uh, speaking of the pro tip, uh, the Center for Cooperative Media at Montclair State University brings you the local connection newsletter. Each week, it offers story ideas and pro tips for journalists. Best of all, it's free. You can subscribe at bit.ly slash local news tips, bit.ly slash local news tips. Uh, we have a uh, show coming up uh, this week. Our colleague Rose Horowitz is hosting a Women to Follow show um, on Tuesday, November 15th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, 5, p.m. 5 p.m. Pacific. Her guest is Judine Somerville, a Broadway performer in The Dynamites, uh, as, as The Dynamites in Hairspray, on the town, the life, crazy for you, and a recipient of the legacy robe. So tune in to Rosa's show on Tuesday, November 15th. And as I mentioned, Dan Barry is going to be our, our guest. That's December 4th, not December 5th. Uh, he is a longtime reporter and columnist of the New York Times. We are taking two weeks off for the Thanksgiving holiday, but we will be back. I am particularly looking forward to having Dan join us. He is an incredible storyteller, and you won't want to miss uh, that show. Uh, with that, I want to bring Walter back on. Uh, Walter, uh, thank you again for your patience. Um, we would like to ask you for your pro tip for journalists. Yeah, we're in a very unusual moment um, as, as professional scholars, but especially historians, where there's a huge debate about should scholars be involved in journalism? And of course, this hits close to home for me because of the 1619 Project and my support for Nicole Hannah-Jones from when she first arrived at the New York Times. But we need find stronger bridges and clearer ways for scholars and journalists to collaborate. And I think what you do here with the read-along is a really great example. And so the way that, that Paula makes both journalistic articles and access to scholarly, scholarly materials readily available for the audience, I think we can do that in print media. I think we can do it across convergence media as well. So that's my pro tip, finding more ways to bring the best information and awarding credit to both journalists and scholars as we move forward together. Thank you very much, Walter. Appreciate that. I want to share some of the comments that, that came in um, as we close out the show. Um, let's see here. Uh, one of, uh, Amber Murphy, Amber Coleman Murphy is saying thank you. Uh, to Walter, we have to call that out more. I think that's when we were talking about the the elections, uh, certainly. Um, and uh, Rose quoted you, Hesit hesitancy to stand behind black women, uh, referring to Stacey Abrams. Um, absolutely. Uh, Mary uh, Curtis noted that there was the chance of having Sherry Beasley in the Senate, uh, which would have been incredible and coming from North Carolina as as well. Uh, North Carolina is a tough state. Their state legislature, the Republicans have a supermajority in the state Senate and fell one vote short in the House of having a supermajority. Um, and it's the longtime home of Jesse Helms, uh, if you go back 20 years or so. So it, certainly, if we can get there, uh, it would be great to turn North Carolina in, in due time. Apollo uh, says thank you uh, uh, to Paula and Neil and Professor Grayson uh, and uh, calling it an awesome show. Um, Mary Curtis says thank you so much, Walter, uh, for a great and needed conversation. Uh, Amber says storytellers and truth tellers unite. Um, and Ellen says thank you all. Uh, so again, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us. If you did join us late, uh, as soon as we finish the broadcast, this show will be available on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and our Digimentors website on the same links where you're watching uh, now. So thank you for joining us. Uh, Walter, 
three three time uh three time guest thank you thank you thank you three thank yous for that uh and we look forward to keeping in touch and and monitoring all these uh various dynamics that you've been talking about today thank you so much thank you have a great uh weekend everyone we'll see you in two weeks